It's Tom Hartman University Book Club. Today we're reading from The Last Hours of Ancient Sunlight. This is toward the very end, and it's a chapter titled Transforming Culture Through Politics. Many think it's just to fund tax cuts and subsidies for the rich, that the multimillionaire CEOs who've taken over almost all senior posts in government are just pigs at the trough. And this is a spectacular but ordinary form of self-serving corruption. It all seems so plausible, and there's even a grain of truth to it. But juicy deals for right-wing government insiders and their friends are just a byproduct of the real and deeper war against democracy. The neoconservatives are perf perfectly happy for us to think that they're just opportunists skirting the edges of legality and morality. But this is far more dangerous than simple government corruption. Indeed, the neoconservatives claim to be anti-government. As a leading spokesman for the neocon agenda, Grover Norquist told National Public Radio's Mara Liason in a May 25th, 2001 Morning Edition interview, quote, I don't want to abolish government. I simply want to reduce it to the size where I can drag it into the bathroom and drown it in the bathtub, end quote. Without a larger view, the issues of domestic spending, oil, neoconservative power plays in both major parties, the loss of liberties, anti-government rhetoric, and war in the Middle East all seem like separate and unconnected events. They're not. The new conservatives who've seized the Republican Party and who, through the Democratic Leadership Council, are nipping at the heels of the Democratic Party are not our parents' conservatives. Historic conservatives like Barry Goldwater, Harry Truman, and Dwight Eisenhower would be appalled, although their philosophical roots go back to Alexander Hamilton, who openly argued during the Constitutional Convention that royalty was the best form of government. The neocons have always been kept to the fringe. Indeed, the Reagan-Bush revolution flew in the face of traditional conservative ideals. As John Stockwell notes in his book, The Praetorian Guard, the U.S. role in the New World Order, Reagan-Bush were proud of their contempt for their concerns of environmentalists, with Reagan once saying, if you've seen one Redwood, you've seen them all. Their Department of the Interior under James Watt sold off minerals and forests to campaign contributors at fire sale prices, and their EPA, in many cases, moved from prosecuting corporate polluters to legitimizing and protecting them under the guise of regulation. Although James Madison wrote in 1792 that an important role of government was to promote a strong middle class, quote, by the silent operation of the laws, which, without, with, without violating the rights of property, reduce extreme wealth toward a state of mediocrity and raise extreme indigence toward a state of comfort, end of quote from James Madison. That was not a sentiment shared by those in the Reagan-Bush revolution. Instead, Reagan, Reagan raised taxes on the middle class and working people while cutting taxes by more than 60% for the most wealthy in America. At the same time, he bragged that he'd eliminated more than 1,000 programs for poor people and even proposed that poor school, school children should be content with ketchup as their daily vegetable. At the same time, the Reagan-Bush administration and later the George W. Bush administration worked hard to roll back the very individual liberties that America's founders had fought and died for. Dwight Eisenhower left office warning Americans about the dangers of the concentration of power resulting from corporations getting into bed with the military. But the Reagan-Bush and W. Bush administrations openly embraced these corporate powers, inviting them into the halls of governance and hungrily sucking at the teat of their campaign contributions. In the past, those promoting what, what is now called the new conservative agenda went by different names. The founders of America knew that for 6,000 years, civilized human beings had been ruled by one of three groups, kings, theocrats, or feudal lords. Kings held power by virtue of the threat of violence and continual warfare. Theocrats and popes held power by the people's fear of a god or gods, and feudal lords by wealth and the power that comes from throwing average people into poverty. The new idea of our founders in 1776 was to throw off all three of these historic tyrannies, and replace them with a fourth way, the people being ruled by themselves, a government that derived its legitimacy and continuing existence solely from the approval of its citizens. Government of, by, and for we the people. They called it a constitutional Republican democracy. What we are seeing now in the conservative agenda is nothing less than an attempt to overthrow Republican democracy and replace it with a worldwide feudal state. What we are the last time this happened, the feudalists took over a monarchy in then North America. In December 1600, Queen Elizabeth I chartered the East India Company, ultimately leading to a corporate takeover of the Americas for the colonists.
that ended with the Boston Tea Party and three years later, the American Revolution. The corporate state partnership of the East India Company in the UK went on to then to conquer India, but eventually disintegrated as the British Empire faded and the British government, along with most of Western Europe, embraced somewhat more Jeffersonian forms of democracy. Conservatism raised its head again in the 20th century, revived by Franco, Hitler, and Mussolini. The Italian dictator even used the word corporatism to describe it and then later renamed it as fascism, a word defined by the American uh, Heritage Dictionary as, quote, a system of government that exercises a dictatorship of the extreme right, typically through the merging of state and business leadership together with belligerent nationalism. The book is The Last Hours of Ancient Sunlight.